We had a visitor the other day who made a strange comment that my approach to insight followed Majima 64. And I always thought that my approach to insight had followed John Fuang. The Majima 64 does talk about one way in which insight develops, in which you analyze your concentration first into the different aggregates. When you're sitting here, you've got form, which is the breath, feeling, which is the feeling of pleasure you're trying to develop, perception, the image you hold in mind, how the breath moves through the body, where it starts, where it finishes. Fabrication, how you talk to yourself about the breath, evaluate it, make adjustments. And then consciousness, which is aware of all these things. You're aware of these things, you're aware of how they're inconstant, stressful, not self. And that provides an opening to insight, the insight to release. Well, that's one way in which insight can arise. Living with Ajahn Fuang, I discovered he had lots of different ways that he would recommend. There's another way, I've forgotten the number and name of the sutta, in which basically the insight arises as you go from one level of concentration to another. And you see the different fabrications fall away. Verbal fabrication falls away as you move from the first to the second jhana. Bodily fabrication falls away as you move from the third to the fourth. And then mental fabrication would fall away when you move from the dimension of neither perception or non-perception to the cessation of perception and feeling. That's way up there. That's another way in which insight can arise. You just see how the mind constructs things and how you can move from one construction to another. And you begin to see how it's fabricated, how you put these things together. And that insight helps you develop some dispassion for the concentration. Because that's the important thing, how you develop dispassion. And that's going to vary from person to person, which level of concentration is going to happen on, whether it's going to happen in the concentration or as you move from one level to another, or as you leave concentration. Or there's stories in the canon where people are washing their feet and they gain concentration, and then from the concentration they gain insight. So all kinds of things can happen and spark your insight. That was one of the things I learned from Ajahn Fuang. He said, you can hear about other people's strategies for developing discernment, for developing insight, and you can't assume that they will work for you the way they work for the other people. It's good to read about them to get some ideas of what kinds of things have helped other people. But you're going to have to look at your own mind and see what works. And you're going to have to use your own ingenuity. This boils down to those two words that I keep repeating over and over again, which John Fuang kept repeating over and over again. You're observant and you use your ingenuity, and that's how you develop in your med meditation. Now, an important part of being observant is something that he would teach across the board, which is you've got to get a very strong sense of the watcher or the knower in your meditation. They can watch anything, not get excited by it, not get upset by it, but just be able to watch what's going on. And this is an ability that you really have to consciously develop. Some people have to more trouble with it than others. But time and again I would hear people coming to see John Fung and they say, well, as I watch my mind, and if something bad comes up, I try to get rid of it, or if something good, I allow it to continue. And, but, and he would say, well, learn how to watch the bad things too. You don't follow them, you don't act on them, but learn how to watch your defilements. Because he says, sometimes your defilements have their good side. This is a point he picked up from a John Lee. If we didn't have desire, we wouldn't be here practicing. If we didn't crave the end of suffering, we wouldn't be here practicing. If we didn't realize that we have some ignorance, we wouldn't search for knowledge. 
So even the defilements can have their good side. But it requires that you develop a very resilient observer inside. Because an important part of the observer is you learn to be aware of things and then just drop it at that. And you don't continue, as they say, anti-weaving things. You notice the presence of something, you observe what it's doing. But you don't play its games. You're gaining a sense of how to watch something in the mind and be separate from it. Now this is one of the important principles of gaining discernment. You hear so much about seeing the oneness of all things, but when the Buddha talks about insight, it's all about seeing things as separate. Your awareness is one thing, your greed is something else, your anger is something else. If you're watching pain, the pain is one thing, the awareness is something else, the body is something else. It's this ability to watch, to step back, that allows you to see the whole story. One of John Fuggins complained to him one time that the insights she gained in her meditation were all very fragmentary. He says it's like listening to a, a record, and he was thinking of the records of the old days, those long playing records where a needle was needed to put in a groove. He says the needle has to stay in the groove. It can't jump around. So when something good comes up, you stay in the groove. When something bad comes up, you stay in the groove. It reminded me of a novel that I taught when I was teaching English in Chiang Mai University. I had the students read the Ford Medics Ford, The Good Soldier, which admittedly, even for a native speaker, is not an easy book to read. But I wanted to stretch the students and also to get them to think about the narrator. Because that's what the book is all about. This man is narrating basically his wife's suicide and his best friend's suicide. And he plays a role in both. Doesn't help intervene, doesn't help to stop them when he could have, perhaps. And as he's telling the story, any time he comes across some incriminating evidence, he jumps over it. When he's telling it, this incident, it looks like he's portraying himself in a bad way, he'll suddenly switch to something else. So the book jumps around, that's why it's a difficult book to read. But our minds are just like that. We're thinking along and something makes us look bad, or just shows us something about ourselves that we don't like to see, and we jump. The needle jumps out of the groove. You know, and a record like that is when the needle's jumping around, screech, scratch, screech, scratch, no sense to anything at all. So you want to make sense out of your own mind. You have to stick with things good and bad. And just tell yourself, as the John Fuhrman told one of his students, look, the mind can think good things, why can't it think bad things? Just make sure you don't fall under the power of the bad things, but you learn how to step back from both. Because that's when you get to see the mind in and of itself. Because that's the real culprit. It's not that the good or bad things are the culprits. It's how we relate to them. Like that passage in the canon where the question is when you have two oxen, a black one and a white one. Is the black one the fetter of the white? Is the white one the fetter of the black? No, it's the yoke that's holding them two together. That's what's holding them. In the same way. Sights are not the fetter of the eye. The eye is not the fetter of sights, and so down with all the senses. It's the passion and desire between the two of them. The passion and desire that connects them. So that's what you want to see. Where does the passion and desire come from? It comes out of the mind. So whatever comes up, you want to learn how to keep that in control as you just watch. You don't act on it, but you see it, that this is an event in the mind. And when you can see the events in the mind simply as that, as events, then you're going to learn about them. And whichever way your insight is going to come, 
quite a number of questions you ask about why does something make inroads into the mind when it doesn't have to. That's what you have to realize. Things don't have to make inroads on the mind. We let our mind get colored by its, its objects. But it doesn't have to be. But we take it so much for granted. Something sad happens and the whole mind gets sad. Something pleasant happens and the whole mind gets happy. This may be one of the reasons why the Buddha uses the word raga to describe these fetters. Because it also means color. It's like putting dye into some water. You put some blue dye into some water and it doesn't take long for the whole glass of water to get blue. You put red in and it doesn't take long for the whole glass to get red. That's our problem. We allow our minds to be colored by what we see and what we know. And in developing this sense of the observer, you have to learn how to say, okay, the observer is one thing, your awareness is something else. The object is something else. And they don't have to be connected. So that your observer and your awareness can stay clear, even in the presence of red or yellow or blue or green things. That's the part of the training of the mind that's constant for everybody. Now how you're going to gain your insight, what questions you're going to ask that are going to break things open, that's going to be an individual matter. We learn from the strategies of others what's possible, what could work, but that's not necessarily going to work for us. So this is where you're encouraged to ask your own questions. To understand your own greed, aversion, delusion, your own desires and passions. And learn to develop some dispassion around them. It basically comes down to that little pattern of seeing the allure and seeing the drawbacks. And catching yourself going for the allure when and we realize at the same time, this is nothing worth going for. when that's going to happen, how that's going to happen, we can't say. But what you do is you create the conditions for it, for it to become likely to happen. That's all dependent on learning how to make this sense of the observer strong and independent and not colored by anything around it.